Hello and welcome to the online ministry of New Westminster Christian Reformed Church. We hope that today's message will be a word of encouragement for you from our Lord Jesus Christ. If you would like to contact our church or our pastors, please visit our website at nwcrc.ca. May God bless you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Certainly a blessed Thanksgiving weekend to all of you. I hope that you're able to enjoy this weekend, giving thanks together with those who are dear to you. Uh, And I want to give thanks to George in particular for blessing us with this lovely harvest display. Some of those gift baskets will be sent to those in our congregation that uh, the deacons will take care of. So thank you, George, for that. You know, as we've been going through this sermon series, the contemporary testimony, Our World Belongs to God, we're now in this section called Creation, the first of several sections in the testimony. And it strikes me that on this Thanksgiving Sunday, that the very foundation of our Thanksgiving stems from the gracious act of God creating us and all that is. In fact, Neil Plantinga speaks of God's act of creation as a marvelous gift of hospitality. Listen to what he writes. Supposing that hospitality means to make room for others and then to help them flourish in the room you have made. I think we could say that hospitality thrives within the triune life of God and then spreads wonderfully to the creatures of God. You might say creation is a result of God's self-giving love, his desire to make room for others so that they might flourish. And gratitude, thanksgiving, is the only fitting response for us. This morning, our scripture reading is from the very beginning of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1. This is the word of God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good. He separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And God said, let there be a vault between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the vault and separated the water under the vault from the water above it. And it was so. God called the vault sky. And there was evening and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the water under the sky be gathered to one place and let dry ground appear. And it was so. God called the dry ground land and the gathered waters he called seas, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it according to their various kinds. And it was so. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And God saw it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the night. And let them serve as signs to mark sacred times and days and years. And let them be lights in the vault of the sky to give light on earth. And it was so. God made two great lights. The greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. God set them in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth, to govern the day and the night, and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. And God said, let the water teem with living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the vault of the sky. So God created the great creatures of the sea and every living thing which the waters teems and that moves about in it according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. 
God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth and the seas and let the birds increase on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning the fifth day. And God said, Let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds. The livestock, the creatures that move along the ground, the wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every other living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit in it with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and the birds in the sky and the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has breath in it, I will give every green plant for food. And so it was. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. Thus the heavens and earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Thus far, our reading from God's good word. This week in my preparation, I came across a delightful children's book. I was introduced to it when I was reading Chuck Colson's fine book called How Now Shall We Live. In fact, I've been leaning on that a little bit as we've gone through this particular series. And in his book, he provides a short summary of this delightful children's book, which I ended up reading, of course, and purchased for my wife's it's grade three class. She doesn't know that yet, but now she does. It's a wonderful book, and as you know, good children's books open up some of life's deepest and most provocative questions. And this one does it in a particularly winsome, humorous, and provocative way. The book is called Yellow and Pink. Anybody heard that about that book? Oh, wow. New. New to most of us. All of us, perhaps. Yellow and Pink by William Stieg. It begins with two wooden figurines, marionette puppets, if you will, waking up and finding themselves lying on an old newspaper in the hot sun. And Yellow sits up and asks, Do you know what we're doing here? No, Pink says to Yellow. I don't even remember getting here. And that then begins a long debate between the two marionettes over the origin of their existence. Pink looks over the intricacies of how he's been formed and how yellow has been formed and says, someone must have made us. And yellow says, I say we're an accident. And then yellow begins to outline the possible ways of how it all happened. A branch might have broken off of a tree, fallen on a sharp rock, splitting one end of the branch into two legs. Then the wind might have sent it tumbling down a hill until it was chipped and shaped. Perhaps a flash of lightning struck it in such a way as to splinter the wood into hands and fingers. Eyes might have been formed by woodpeckers pecking through the wood. Then, Yellow says, with enough time, a thousand, a million, maybe two million and a half years, lots of unusual things could have happened. Why not us? The debate continues back and forth between Yellow and Pink. In the end, the discussion is cut off by the appearance of a man coming out of a nearby house. 
he strolls over to the marionettes, picks them up, checks their paint, and says, nice and dry. He tucks the wooden figures under his arm and heads back towards the house. Peering out from underneath that man's arm, Yellow whispers to Pink, Who's that guy? And so ends the book. The Bible is God's self disclosure, it's God's self revelation that tells us the answer to who's this guy? God discloses himself to us because there's no way that we in ourselves could find him. Now, some of you might be saying, I don't ask that question, who's this guy in the sky? I don't believe in any of that. Well, then maybe you're going to have to answer the question, well, who was that guy that walked our planet 2,000 years ago? Who taught in the region of Galilee and Judea? You have to ask yourself the question, who's that guy? Because he entered into human history. And many people who saw him invited others to come and see who this man is. And when they listened to his teaching, when they saw his miraculous signs and wonders, many people asked, who's this guy? This is how one of Jesus' earliest followers answers that question. The Son is the image. That is, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. The firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. Who is this man? Jesus? That's who he is. And another of his earliest followers wrote this, just as we read last week. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. And this Word, we read, is Jesus. Christianity is the only worldview in human history that tells us the creator of heaven and earth and all that exists, that being entered into our time and space, took on flesh. Literally, that's incarnation. God enfleshed. Like the man in the story, yellow and pink. This God, this being entered into human history, into his story and confirmed what was said at the very beginning it is very good so very good Jesus believed that he was willing to die in order to save it that's the message in life of Jesus God, through Jesus Christ, created a good and beautiful world, a world that he intended to co-rule with us, his image bearers. That's essentially the message of Genesis 1, and that's what we're going to look at this morning. In his book, The Lost World of Genesis 1, Old Testament scholar John Walton says, that any person in the ancient Near East, that's the time when the Old Testament was first being written, along with other writings from other ancient cultures, in that time, for any person reading or listening to Genesis 1, what they most certainly would not have concluded is this, that Genesis 1 is about how God created the world in six literal 24-hour days. 
That is not what they would have thought Genesis 1 was intending to tell, and neither should we. The simple, that simple fact should end decades of debate on whether the Bible can be trusted. You know the line, science tells us the world was created in billions of years, and this Bible says it was created in six 24-hour days. Obviously, the Bible's wrong, so it can't be trusted. That's how it goes. No. No person who first read this passage in Genesis 1 centuries ago would have assumed that its point was to tell us God created in six literal 24-hour days. So what would they have believed about Genesis 1, you ask? Well, they would have believed that God, this God being described was, was creating a temple that he himself intended to dwell in. A temple. Andrew, it says a garden. That's true, it does. But if you would have visited temples in the ancient Near East, and you can still visit some of them, obviously, in places like Egypt and other places, when you visit those ancient temples, one of the things, and this was what struck me perhaps most significantly when a few years ago I was in a number of Egyptian temples. These temples are like magnificent gardens. Those tall columns that you see in those Egyptian temples, they are intended to be papyrus trees or lotus trees with beautiful buds either opening up or beautiful buds that have closed. All over the walls are murals of, of fruitfulness, of bounty, of beautiful life. This temple, in a sense, was a garden. And the garden was what depicted shalom, fruitfulness. Even in Egypt, you will see outside on the walls surrounding that temple... Images of chaos depicted by the rolling waves of water that are made out of brick. Temples were like gardens. Sacred places where things were as they should be. A place of order, of beauty, and of fruitfulness. And so Genesis 1 begins with this sense of disorder of chaos, of, of emptiness, right? Formless and void. Tohu vabohu is what it says in Hebrew, literally meaning no form, empty, chaos, empty. And what does God do? Well, God brings form and order. That's days one, two, and three. And God fills that form, taking away the emptiness. That's day four, five, and six. Right? Day one, God creates light and creates time, separate, using light to separate the day from the night. Day two, he creates a vault or sky, space between the waters above and the waters below. On day three, he creates land. By separating the waters, a fruitful, fruit-giving land. On the first three days, God creates these forms, taking what was disordered and chaotic and creating order and form. And then day four, five, and six, he takes what was initially empty, void, and fills it. He fills day and night with a great light and a lesser light, right? And the stars in the sky. On the fifth day, he, he fills that vault that separated the sky and the waters. He fills that sky with birds. He fills those waters with fish. And on the sixth day, he fills the land with all kinds of life or with all kinds of different creatures. And after every day, God said, it is good. Then came that last creature, humankind. All humanity is what the Bible is intending to say. 
And then we encounter this most important word, this word image. This was a clue for the ancients that this indeed was a temple. Why? Because in every ancient temple, the image of the God was placed. And in most ancient cultures, the image of the God was the Pharaoh or the king. He was the only one that was allowed to go into the very inner sanctum of the ancient temples because he alone was one made in the image of the gods. Except in Genesis 1, humanity is God's image. Unlike in the ancient cultures where only the king was made in the image of God and only the king was given the ability to rule and have dominion over... In the creation story, it's humankind made in God's own image. And it's humankind that has been given the task of co-ruling creation with God. Caretaking. We see that clearly in Genesis 1.28. God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea, birds in the sky, and every living creature that moves on the ground. And God said, humankind, all creation was very good. And then God rested. On the final day, God rested. Making it possible for us to rest. Not it, to rest in the sense of doing nothing. No, not at all. We were just given the task of ruling and subduing and filling, but rather resting in the sense that no work required us to work by the sweat of our brow. There were no forces in the world that would oppose us or threaten us. We could live without worry or anxiety or illness or disease. This is biblical rest. And God freely gave us that. Just briefly, one more reason why the ancients would have seen this to be the story of God creating a temple that he himself intends to dwell in is, is because a temple was that place of perfection. The temple was the place where life was as it was supposed to be. And the number seven to the ancients symbolized that perfection. It's no surprise then for the, the original readers to hear this in the original text. Seven days. Verse 1 has seven Hebrew words. Verse 2 has two times seven Hebrew words. God's name is mentioned five times seven in this passage, 35 times. Heaven and earth is mentioned three times seven, 21 times. Seven is all over the place in this narrative. Because this is a temple that God himself intends to dwell in. You're thinking with me, what a beautiful story. God in Jesus making a good and beautiful world, filling it with life, filling it with potential, and making us his image bearers to co-rule and co-create, to take care of all that he has made with him enjoying his rest, shalom, well-being. Oh, Andrew, this is a good story. It is. Our world belongs to God, captures it well in paragraph 9. God formed sky, land, and sea, stars above moon, sun, making a world of color, beauty, and variety, a fitting home for plants and animals and us, a place to work and play, worship and wonder, love and laugh. God rested and gave us rest. In the beginning, everything was very good. Now, let me ask you how this well, let me ask you two questions. The first, of the, the first of which is, how might this creation story have compared with other creation stories in the ancient world? 
That's been a a more recent discovery within the last 100 plus years of other creation myths that existed alongside this one. How might this creation story compare to them? Well, I could list all kinds of comparisons, but let me simply highlight this one. In those other creation narratives, one called Enuma Elish, it also speaks of man, humankind, being created from the dust of the earth. But in that story, the dust of the earth is mixed with demon's blood. And in another creation myth story called Atrahapsis, hard to pronounce, Atrahapsis, A second ingredient is not just demon's blood, but the spit of the gods. Humanity's dust is mixed with blood of demons, with the spit of the gods. Why? Well, humankind were largely servants of the gods, slaves of the gods. In one particular creation story, we see that Their purpose is to relieve the lesser gods from the arduous labor of digging irrigation ditches. That was the glorious purpose of humankind in those accounts. Contrast that to the biblical account, which is wholly unique. Man made in the image of God. All humankind, male and female, to co-rule God's good world. Now that was the worldview of the ancient world in which the average person really had no dignity, no value or purpose. In the story of the Exodus, that Pharaoh would take a whole community of people like the Hebrews and force them to slavery. Well, that fit his worldview perfectly. These people were the product of foreign gods that we have no deference towards. Of course we use them as slaves. But that brings me to the second question. How does this creation story compare with the creation story that's dominant in our day? That is, as we learned last week, the story of of naturalism which, of course, many believe. A professor by the name of William Provine of Cornell University, he's an evolutionary biologist, and he speaks often on university campuses and is quite bold about describing the naturalistic worldview that that underlies naturalism. This is how Charles Coulson, in his book, summarized it. He declares forthrightly that Darwinism is not just about mutations and fossils. It's a comprehensive philosophy stating that all of life can be explained by natural causes acting randomly, which implies that there is no need for the creator. And if God did not create the world, he notes, then the entire body of Christian belief collapses. Provine lectures on many campuses, and in order to hammer home what Darwinism really means, he'll often say this, no life after death, no ultimate foundation for ethics, no ultimate meaning for life, no free will. That's the dominant creation story of our day. We heard how that affected ancient cultures. What about our culture? Colson asks this question in his book. What's the value of human life? The most vexing cultural issues of our day, he says, abortion, assisted suicide, euthanasia, genetic engineering, all turn on questions about what it means to be human, about the value of human life and how it should be protected. Who are we? 
What are we? That's the question that many are wrestling with in a world that denies God and believes that naturalistic evolution is what was used to bring about what is. What are we then? Well, a good case can be made that this question started to get answered in a very different way beginning in the 1700s at the start of the Enlightenment. A well-known philosopher by the name of Rene Descartes offered this dictum, I think, therefore I am. The human mind, not God, is the source of certainty. The human mind is what gives us our human experience. And human experience, how I feel about myself, is the fixed point around which everything else revolves. That was a most significant dictum given by René Descartes. In a way, it began to separate us into minds and bodies. If the mind is the center of our being, what does that mean for our bodies? More recently, a Princeton professor by the name of Robert George, he talks about how this way of thinking creates a kind of dualism between body and mind, where the body is little more than a machine that is controlled by the mind. He says, it follows that the body is not really me, but something separate from my real self, my essential self. And it's an instrument to be used, like a car or a computer, for whatever purpose I might choose. Therefore, even whatever I do with my body, whether it's for physical pleasure or even if I discard it because it's no longer convenient for me, that ultimately has no moral significance. Charles Coulson carries this a little further and writes, Carried to its logical conclusion... This view implies that sexual acts between unmarried people or partners of the same sex or even complete strangers have no moral significance. Since the body is reduced to the status of a mere instrument of the conscious self, it can be used for any form of pleasure and mutual gratification as long as, as there is no coercion. Even disposing of physical life is of no greater moral consequence than discarding an old set of ill-fitting clothes. I think many of us, when we read that or hear that, are thinking in our own time how this is increasingly being expressed. In a world where naturalism is the dominant worldview of the day. What happens, and this historically has always happened to a very small segment of the population, what happens when the way I feel about my sexuality differs from what my body actually tells me about my sexuality? We must always have compassion on those who experience what historically has been called gender dysphoria. Always. It's incumbent on us to, to have compassion and extend embrace. But what happens in an age when this dualism that was described... Remember, we're accidents. We're simply the result of random cause and effect. What happens in, when in this dualistic way of thinking about ourselves, my mind, my essence, my soul tells me that my body got it wrong? Well, then change it. That's the world that we live in today. And you can see how worldviews are, are clashing.
Let me give you another unrelated example to that. It struck me because we saw it on the news this week. A whistleblower was appearing before a government committee. She formerly worked for Facebook. And she's blown the whistle on the fact that Facebook makes algorithms knowingly knowing that when young girls use their platform, Instagram or Facebook, they experience much higher levels of anxiety and harm than those who would not be using it. She testified, Facebook knows it. But they continue to produce those algorithms because it makes money, of course. Don't they care about these young children? Don't they care about how these algorithms are causing heightened levels of anxiety? How these algorithms are distorting what it means to, to have a healthy image of self? Don't they care about that? Why should they, Andrew? I found, and maybe you think I'm drawing the line too far here. Or drawing the connection too far here. Is this almost a new kind of slavery? A new kind of slavery in which for the sake of pure money we will prey on children? I mean, if they're just bundles of, of neurons and electrons and, and don't really have ultimate dignity and value, why not? In the ancient world... Cultures would enslave other people because they had a worldview that said those people don't have the kind of inherent dignity, don't deserve the kind of respect and care that we might give to other people. Do you see how our worldview, how the way we think about the creation and humankind. Do you see how our worldview changes everything? What happens when a culture completely loses its moorings? The foundations are pulled out. Well, the Bible tells that story. Because certainly in the history of the church, in ancient Rome in particular, those foundations had been pulled out in all kinds of different ways. What happens when a world loses its foundation, loses its connection with God? God enters into human history. God expresses his great love by taking on flesh and blood. And coming up to those who are sick and pronouncing healing. Coming up to those who are distressed and casting out demons. Calming the wind and the waves to show his power and authority over all creation. And going so far as to offer himself in order that the world might be saved. That's how good this world is and how much God loves it. So much so that he died to save it. To save you and me. Indeed, God is good. We are good because he loves us and has shown us that in Jesus Christ. And therefore, all God's people can say together, Amen. Amen.